Listen to this. A young boy goes into a drugstore to buy three boxes of chocolate. The pharmacist asks, what size? And he's small, medium, or large. One of each, he said, I've been seeing this girl for a while, and she's really beautiful. And I want the chocolate because I think tonight's the night. We're having dinner with her parents, and then we're going out. And if she lets me hold her hand, I'm going to give her the small box. If she lets me kiss her on the cheek, I'm going to give her the medium box. And if she lets me kiss her on the lips, I'm going to give her the big box. The young man makes his purchase, and he leaves. Later that evening, he sits down to dinner with his girlfriend and her parents, and he asks if he might give the blessing, and they agree. He begins the prayer, but continues praying for quite some time. And the girl leans over and says, you never told me that you were such a religious person. He leans over to her and says, you never told me that your father's a pharmacist. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 7. Starting at verse number 7. Are you with me? It says this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets, and this is the word of the Lord, thanks be unto God. This particular series we've just been looking at, and we're just going to take our time and go through chapter number 7 of Matthew's gospel. And last week we looked at a particular, the first part of 7, where uh, Jesus says, do not judge. And we talked about how that, that particular verse of Scripture and that phrase has just been so misused and abused and people don't really, didn't really understand what it means. And so as a result of that, they use it in a context and in a way that God never intended. And in this passage, here's another passage of Scripture that I think is often misused as well. This idea where, where Jesus says that you can ask, you can seek, you can knock, and whatever you ask for, and where, whatever you seek for, and whatever door that you knock on, it will be open. And this passage is about prayer, but it's about prayer through the lenses of what we usually refer to as the golden rule. How many of you are familiar with the golden rule? What is the golden rule? It's sort of like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And what that basically means is treat people, care about people, relate to people, and give to people as if it were you. And this particular passage, that's how Jesus ends this passage where he begins talking about asking and seeking and knocking, and then he talks about the type of father that he is compared to the type of parents that we are, and then he gets down to this golden rule. Put in practical terms, the, the golden rule means if you know someone who's hungry, feed them as if you were hungry. If you know someone's hungry, give them the same type of food that you would want to eat. If you know somebody who's lonely, provide the same type of company that you would want if you were all alone. Practically speaking, Jesus is saying, if you know somebody who's done something wrong and they're in prison, he says, visit them as if you were in trouble. and You needed someone to come and see about you. He says, if you know somebody who's naked or needs clothes, practically speaking, Jesus would say, get the same type of clothes for them that you would get for yourself if you were in need of clothes. In other words, Jesus says, treat other people the same way you would look out for yourself. Unfortunately, although we all know the golden rule, we don't always live by it. 
And I think what the two main things that prevents us from living according to the golden rule is selfishness and fear. Selfishness because all of us are born selfish. She said I could say it again. All of us are born selfish. All of us are born sinners. All of us are born uh, self-centered. What's the middle letter in the word sin? I. We don't have to teach a child how to want stuff for themselves. We're always trying to teach them how to do what? Share. To share. Because all of us are born selfish. We're born sinners. We're born separated from God. We're, de we're born deprived. We're born spiritually dead. And as a result of that, we are selfish. And because of that selfishness, that's something that we always have to battle with in order to live out how God has called us to live. Not only um, do we have to battle with the selfishness, uh, but most of us live the golden rule from a negative perspective. We live by don't do unto others what we don't want people to do to us. It's just a slight change in the wording, but the implications are completely different. That, that particular phrase, when you put it in the negative, it's motivated by the fear that if I do something wrong to somebody else, it may come back to me. In other words, I'm still doing it out of a sense of self-preservation. I'm still doing it from a place of selfishness because I'm afraid that if I do something bad to somebody, that may come back to me. And God forbid something bad come back to me. And so it's still motivated and out of a sense of fear. So instead of doing good to others, we just try to avoid doing bad. And Jesus wants us to treat people based on love and not fear. You see, love initiates. Fear guards what we have. But love initiates, helps us to live with open hands and open arms. Jesus said, the same thing another way, and that is, he says later he was having a conversation with some folks, and they wanted to know uh, what the greatest commandment was, and he says it this way. He says, love God with everything that you have, and then he says what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Regardless of what people do to us, we should treat them the way that we want to be treated. Whether they have the ability to repay us with good or not, we should respond to others the same way that Jesus responds to us, and it's always out of love. That's the golden rule. And Jesus sums up this golden rule, and he says, he says, the golden rule sums up the law and the prophets in verse number 12. He says, in other words, uh, this fulfills the word of God. That if we could get to the place, if you want to know um, how to fulfill all that the Bible says in terms of the way that we should relate to one another, he says it's all summed up right there. Treat everybody the same way that you would want to be treated. Look at verse number seven. Let's read through it again. 7 and 8. It says, ask, and it will be what? Given to you. Seek, and you will what? Knock, and what happens? The door will be open to you. Look at verse number 8. For everyone who asks, what? And the one who seeks, what? And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Uh, now, if I were you, I would cut this out and paste this on my wall somewhere. And many people have. They've cut out those two verses of Scripture and taken them out of the context and pasted them on a wall and missed the rest of it. So many people look at this and they think, hey, man, God's given me a blank check that whatever I pray for, I should have it. Some people have used that verse to, to make people feel bad, and they said the reason that you don't have everything, the reason that you don't have millions of dollars and, and driving 10 cars and living in a, in a mansion on a hill is because you don't have enough faith to believe because the Bible says you can ask for whatever you want. Now, we know if we could ask for whatever we want and we got it all, we wouldn't be here half of us today. We'd be on some 
tropical island right now, cracking our toes, enjoying the breeze. But that's how some people view this. It must be a blank check or maybe uh, it's, it's the blab it and grab it. All I have to do is name it and claim it and God will give it to me. But we can't take it out of context and we can't ignore everything, the full counsel of what God says. This promise that God gives us, and it is a promise, but it has some conditions. Here are a few of the conditions. The first one is you must be a child of God. This promise that God is making, he's not just making it to everybody and anybody, he's making it to his children. And here's the thing. We live in a culture, we live in a society where everybody believes that everybody is a child of God. And scripture doesn't say that. It sounds nice, but it's just not biblical. John 1, 12 through 13 says this. Yet to all who did receive him, receive who? Receive Jesus. To those who believe in his name. He made the right to become what? Children of God. Children not born of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. In other words, John is saying that this promise is for those who have been born again. For those of us who name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for those of us who have put our trust in him and have made a decision to follow him, to live for him, He says, this promise is for you. Not only that, there's another condition. He says, the second condition that I'd like to present to you is you must be living in obedience. Mm -mm. You can't be living in deliberate disobedience and expect all the promises of God to flow in your life. And when you live in disobedience, when you deliberately, now don't get me wrong, none of us are perfect. You, that was your chance to say amen. None of us are perfect. We all miss the mark. But there's a difference between, because here's what I love about God. This is what I love about God. He grades based on our heart and not so much always our actions. Because sometimes my motives are right, but I just said it the wrong way. You, you've never been there. Oh, okay. Sometimes, and and I I live with a woman. I love her with everything. Man, Glennis, Leanna, Brinkley, Shirai, I'm strung out on her. And my heart is right. But my mouth. Sometimes it gets lost in the translation. It just, I meant well, Owano. I, I, and, and then I'm looking at it like, why you take it like that? Can't you? Why, 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 why are you looking at me cross-eyed right now, mamacita? What what I, what I do? Because my heart is right. My heart. I meant right. I meant, can you? And what I'm saying is that, that there's sometimes that we may miss the mark But our heart's desire is to live in obedience to him. And when we do get it wrong, we we grieve sin enough to repent. We've gotten away from grieving our sins. We've gotten to the place where it's just, we can dance over it or sing over it or just move on from it. We've gotten past the place where we, when was the last time you just grieved over your sin. You must live in obedience because disobedience blocks our prayer. First John chapter number 3, look at verse number 21. It says this, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Why? Because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. So we must be living in obedience. The third thing that uh, we have to, the third condition that I want to share with you is uh, you must have the right motives. If you, if you want to ask and seek and knock and expect God uh, to move on your behalf, you've got to do it with the right motives. You know what the wrong motives are? 
Selfishness. Selfishness. James puts it this way in James 4 and 3. He says, when you ask, you do not receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives. How do you ask? What is your motive? That you may spend what you get on your, on your own selfish pleasures. And that's not how God wants us to live. Thank God that he's a God of more than enough. Thank God that he's a God that not only does he meet all of our needs, but then he even grants us our heart's desires. Thank God for all of that. But he always wants us to live with an open hand. He always wants us to live with an eye on how can I put somebody else's needs above mine. And then the fourth condition uh, for, for, for being able to ask and seek and knock and get it and have those things answered and received is you must, it must be according to his will. The things that we ask for, the things that we seek after, the doors that we're knocking on, in order for him to grant them, it has to be according to his will. 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. Oh, man, that's, we could stay there all day. Isn't it awesome that we can approach God with confidence? Oh. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we have asked of him. Do you know what God's will is for you? His will is for you that you would treat people the same way that you treat yourself. So here's the deal. Jesus says, if you're a child of God and you're living in obedience to his word and your motives are right and you're asking according to his will and his will is to treat others as yourself, God is going to give you everything you ask for so that you can give to the hungry, so that you can clothe the naked, so that you can visit the imprisoned, so that you can care for the lonely. God says, I want you to live this way. And if you live this way, then you can ask for whatever you want, and I will always replenish you so that you can continue to live this way. Does that make sense? The asking and the seeking and the knocking is so that you would always have a steady supply of everything that you... Why am I screaming? <laughs> I'm like hearing myself screaming. Why are you screaming? So that you could live in such a way that you live beyond yourself. And the beauty of it is because God wants us to live by faith. He wants you to trust him enough that you would be willing to give to those around you that you see in need knowing that he will supply everything you need so that you'll have enough for you and to give. Do unto others the way that you would want things to be done for you. This particular teaching goes against everything inside of us. Because we live to protect ourselves. We live the moment we get something, we can't hang on to it tight enough. And when we get it, we guard it from everybody else. Because we don't believe that if we let it go, God will give us even more. We don't believe that God would meet every one of our needs. We don't believe that if we saw someone naked and gave them our clothes, that God wouldn't supply the clothes for Lord, us. Help us, Lord, help us. That, that if somebody, if somebody they couldn't celebrate and, and, and have good things, that if we gave to them, oh, that he wouldn't, if we furnished their house with our furniture, that he wouldn't replenish the furniture that we gave. what Jesus is saying. Ask, seek, knock, because if you're living this way, I'm going to replenish everything that you 
Some of you, you, you your problem isn't that you're, 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 you, 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 the issue for you isn't that you need to hang on to more stuff. The issue is you need to. Because here's, how the, way, here's the way God gives. He says he gives it good measure. <clears throat> you ever try to pack something and it's too big for the box and you know it's too big for the box? <laughs> running over he says he says I'll touch the hearts of people and men will people will and you'll have more than enough but but do we trust him enough to let it out of our hands and trust that he will multiply it back Let's look at verses 9 through 11. Uh, Jesus gives an illustration here, and he talks about, he compares, and talks about a, an earthly father and relates it to himself. He says in verse 9, which of you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? And, 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 and we're, 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 we're thinking about this, and when I thought about this, I thought about Wonder Bread. I thought about a loaf. And, but back then, they didn't, their bread didn't look like that. Their bread looked more like a round, smooth. It looked like a stone. So, so, so what Jesus is saying is if, if your kid, if an earthly father and their kid asked them for a piece of bread, what earthly father would deceive him by giving him a, a stone? He says, no, no, an earthly father wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't do that. And then in, 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 in verse number 10, he says, if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake. And, and here, uh, what, he, what he's talking about is, um, he, he, when, I, when I first thought about this, I'm like thinking of like this live snake, like who would give a kid a live snake that would possibly buy? But, but he's not talking about that. Really, what he's talking about is a cooked, a cooked snake. And the idea is, in, in the, if you look in the book of Leviticus, um, God gives specific instructions on some of the things that they could eat that were considered clean and other things that they couldn't eat that were considered unclean. And if you were to, to take something that was unclean, you would be considered defiled. And so what Jesus is saying is if your kid asks for a fish, would you give him something instead that would defile him? You, an earthly parent. Verse 12, or verse 11 says, If you then, though you are evil. Now he's, 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 not, he's talking to us. He's, he's talking to his followers. He says, if you who are evil, you who are selfish and sinful, if you have the ability to give good gifts to your children, and I am the perfect father who only gives good gifts, if you have the ability to do that, he, he says, I'll just read what it says. Then you who are even know how to give good gifts to your children. He says, how much more will your father, he's talking about children of God, will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He says, think about it. If you're able to do that, and you, with all of your limitations, and all of your shortcomings, do you understand the type of father that I am? Now, some of us, we don't have a good point of reference. I didn't grow up with a father. I don't have a good point of reference in terms of the relationship that I've had with my father. But I, I, I have kids now, and, uh, and what a blessing that is. And when I became a father, my, my, my whole perspective changed. My whole thinking changed. My whole focus changed. Like, I could go without just as long as my kids have. 
I mean, everything changed. Everything that my wife and I do, we always do it with an eye on how will this impact our children. Our kids don't even know. One of my, kids was, one of my sons was asking me the other day, he says, how much money you got saved for me for college? None of your business, man. And the reason he's asking is because he says, if I get a scholarship, can I get the cash? Well, that's what he said. No, he wanted, he wanted to cash in. He wanted to cash in. Like he saved that money, but now he wants to cash in. Son, it doesn't work that way, son. It doesn't work that way. Is it? I don't know where you're getting this from, but, but my wife and I, before they were even born, set some things in motion. So that what we prepared before they thought about college, we put some things. The, the point I'm making is if I, with my short-sightedness yes. and my limited resources, would take a portion of what we have and set it aside for them, how much? Yes. See, see, what you don't understand, the type of father that you have is you're worried about tomorrow and he's already figured it out. He says, you, why are you worried about tomorrow when I hold all the... To, you don't even know if you're going to see tomorrow, first of all. He says, but, but here's, here's what you need to know. Look around today. Did you eat? Did you wake up under a roof? Do you have a reasonable portion of health? Understand that I'm the one who's providing it all. So he wants us to understand that he is our father. Here's, a, here's another point that I'm going to make, and I'm, I'm going to close. Uh, one of the best compliments, in my opinion, that you can give to a father is to say that, you know, your child, man, your son, your, they, 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 they look just like, because I tell my wife, you, you were just a carrier, right? All of my kids look exactly like me. They all look completely different. They all look exactly like me. And, and, and when somebody says, oh, man, I, I met one of your kids, man, they, they, they remind me so much of you. They kind of talk like you. They have some mannerisms. One of my kids, they say, walks on his toes like me. I don't know. I don't think I walk on my toes. But anyway, maybe when I was 20. 50 pounds lighter, I could walk on my, but <clears throat> he, he said, oh, and, 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 it, and it, man, it really just, I don't know, it just does something to me. I'm, I'm just so proud of that, uh, to see that my kids reflect the things that I value. And, and when they do things that we've been teaching them, my wife and I have been teaching them to do, and then I see them put it into action, oh, man, my chest pokes out, I swell up, I'm just so proud. And, and I think a, a, another huge compliment um, that as a, as a parent that you can get from your child is when they want to follow in your own footsteps. And, and I've been grooming all of my children to follow in my footsteps. I said, you, know, you don't necessarily have to, because some of you are like, oh, you're trying to make them all pastors, aren't you? No. My footsteps are follow Jesus with everything that you have. However that gets worked out. Just give everything. Just follow Jesus. And, and I, think, I think part of this in this particular scripture, what, what I'm hearing is one of the greatest ways that we can honor God is when we reflect his character. And the kind of God that we serve is the kind of God that says, I only give good gifts. That when there's a need present, I'm willing and able to give it. I'm willing and able to meet it. I'm willing and able to make a way. Jesus says, Jesus says, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of flipping the text, but he, because he, he gets to it at the end, he says, he says, here's how I want you to live. Treat everybody around you the way you want to be treated. Not based on how they treat you. 
Not based on whether or not they could repay you one day if you scratch their back. That I'm looking for the day when they can. No, no, no. He says, he says, he says, don't be motivated by fear. Don't be motivated that if, don't be, if, don't be limited that you think that, you know, if I, if I give this away, I may not have for myself. He says, he says, no, no. He says, if you live this way, then you can ask. You seek. You'll knock and, and notice, notice, notice that God says he would meet them, but he asked for our participation. He says, you got to ask. You have not because you ask not. You got to seek. He says, there's times where you've got to knock. God's, God, you said you were going to do it, but he wants you to participate. And I think part of the reason why he wants us to participate is because faith has got to be an action. Faith has got to be moving. He wants, and, and, and as, you, as you're doing that, what happens is it builds our relationship with God to say that, you know what? I'm walking by faith and not by sight. So he says, he says, if you live this way, the promise you have is as your father, I'll make sure that you have more than enough. Do you trust them as your father? Do you trust them to live with open hands and open hearts? Do you trust him to guide your sight to see the needs of the people right around you? We live in an area where there are prisons and juvenile detention centers. People that are incarcerated that get no visitors. What if you were locked up? We have people that live uh, not too far from us that live in, in nursing homes or uh, assisted living facilities and, and they get no visitors. Their family doesn't come. They've sort of been forgotten about. If that were you, what would lift your spirit? Would it be a meal, a card, a flower, a visit? A stranger just coming by to say, hey, just wanted to spend a couple minutes with you. Hey, just wanted to come and crochet with you today. Hey, wanted to just come and color with you. Just wanted to say hello. If you were sick in the hospital, what would you want? If you were naked, if you had no clothes, what, what would you want? What, how, 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 how would you want to be treated? You know, sometimes I'm driving my car and I see these people and they're on the side and, they're, and, they're, and they have a can and they want money. And, and sometimes I have this conversation in my head. I say, I don't know what they're going to do with that money. So what? If that was you, what would you want them to do for you? Don't worry about what they're going to do. <laughs> Just be motivated by love. What I'm saying is if we would take a moment to open our eyes and open our hearts and open our lives, one, we would see just how blessed we are. And the second thing is we could see how we could be a blessing. How many of you have more than one coat? You have more than one coat. You're blessed. How many of you work five or six days a week, but it's enough to provide for seven? <laughs> How many of you right now, because I don't know what this is, like when it's about to snow, my wife has to get milk and eggs? <laughs> oh, that's like the food of, I don't know, that sustains you for 100 years. I don't know what it is. How many of you right now, if you didn't shop for three days, you'd eat. And maybe canned tuna, maybe, you'd eat. There's some people that are walking around with no coat, no food, no shelter. There's some people that have no furniture. They may be sitting in your, on your row. Somebody may be sitting on your row and they don't have gas money for work this week. 
what I'm what are you saying, Pastor Lau? I'm saying, why don't we just start living our lives according to God's will? Treat other people the same way that we want to be treated. Trusting that when we ask, when we seek, when we knock, because we're living according to his word, he's going to replenish everything that we need. Because he, know, he wants you to be blessed so that you can be a blessing. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Would you just take a moment right where you are and just consider, just consider what God is saying to you today. It's not enough for us to just be hearers of the word. We, at some point, we've got to become doers. It's not enough for us to say that we believe in God. Faith without works. How do you know you trust God? How do you know you're generous until you get around needy people? <laughs> so, Father, we admit that we are sinful and selfish. We admit that we're not always motivated by love. We admit that sometimes we deliberately close our eyes to the needs right around us. But today, we're asking you to forgive us. We grieve today over our selfishness and self-centeredness. We grieve today because we live every day, but we're not always mindful of your word. Deliver us. Heal us. Transform us. As we